This morning we will look at the second part of our very short series in the book of Philemon, so I would encourage you to turn there with me in your Bibles. Philemon, we'll be looking at verses 8 through 25. Philemon 8 through 25. Accordingly, though I am bold enough in Christ to command you to do what is required, yet for love's sake I prefer to appeal to you, I, Paul, an old man and now a prisoner also for Christ Jesus. I appeal to you for my child Onesimus, whose father I became in my imprisonment. Formerly he was useless to you, but now now he is indeed useful to you and to me. I am sending him back to you, sending my very heart. I would have been glad to keep him with me in order that he might serve me on your behalf during my imprisonment for the gospel. But I prefer to do nothing without your consent in order that your goodness might not be by compulsion, but of your own accord. For this perhaps is why he was parted from you for a while, that you might have him back forever, no longer as a slave, but more than a slave, as a beloved brother, especially to me, but how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. So if you consider me your partner, receive him as you would receive me. If he has wronged you at all or owes you anything, charge that to my account. I, Paul, write this with my own hand. I will repay it to say nothing of your owing me even your own self. Yes, brother, I want some benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. Confident of your obedience, I write to you knowing that you will do even more than I say. At the same time, prepare a guest room for me. For I am hoping that through your prayers I will be graciously given to you. Apaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, sends greetings to you. And so do Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, and Luke, my fellow workers. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. So far the reading from God's word. May he add its blessing to our hearts this morning. Well, parents... They need to learn to let go of their kids when they reach adulthood, don't they? And it's hard for us. We all recognize it. Uh, I'm 43. Uh, a couple weeks ago, we were at Folly Beach with my dad, and the waves, well, the waves were rough. And uh, he saw me get on my bathing suit, and I was going to go into the ocean with my sons. And my dad said to me, he said, son, are you, uh, are you going in the water? I said, yeah. He said, well, be careful. The waves are are big, don't go too deep. I said, really, Dad? Thank you, I appreciate that. And uh, you ask my children, and they'll probably tell you the same thing, that I hold on a little too tight, because it's hard. It's hard to let go as a parent, sending your children out on their own path. But Paul here has managed to get a hold of it, hasn't he? He speaks to Philemon, his son in the faith, not lording it over him, not giving him a list of things to do or or not to do and saying you better do it or else. But he speaks to him as an equal. He speaks to him as a peer. Philemon and Paul, we saw from the first seven verses, that they are united together. They serve the same God. They are fellow workers. They are brothers in the faith. They are fellow soldiers. They are united And so in this short letter, we see a picture of what Christian interaction ought to look like. The question that Paul asks Philemon, they have little direct application to us. We're not writing or dealing with each other to release a slave back to each other. Those questions aren't directly applicable to us in our day and in our time. But what is applicable to us is is how they speak to each other how they interact with each other, how fellow workers, fellow soldiers, brothers and sisters in Christ can work together and speak together when they ask things of each other. So what Paul asks in this particular book is of less significance to us than how he asks it. And so we want to work ourselves through verses 8 through 25 and seeing how Paul asks of Philemon and what we can learn from it. So we're going to look first at the content of Paul's request in verses 8 through 16. 
Then we're going to look at his plea to Philemon in verses 17 through 21. And then we're going to look at Paul's farewell, his leave in Philemon 22 through 25. So the content, the plea, and the leave. Those are the three things that we're going to uh, broadly use to see how Paul interacts with Philemon. And we see in the first verse, first word of the first verse, verse 8, accordingly, a curious word. And in order to make sense of that word of accordingly, we have to link to what is before. Accordingly is one of those linking words that cues us that we're to look back at what has already been said. And so we look back to verses 4 through 7 where Paul asks Philemon uh, as a friend. It's established the friendship of Philemon, the thankfulness that Paul expresses towards Philemon and how they are united in, in thought, word, and action. Thought in terms of faith, action in terms of uh, the refreshing of the saints and the words in, in terms of the sharing of the faith that Paul has commended Philemon for. And so here we begin to see Paul's question. So accordingly, because of our union together, Paul is saying, <clears throat> he begins his question. Now, Paul could mandate something of Philemon, could he not? What is Paul's role in the early church? He is an apostle. He is a special sent one of the Lord Jesus Christ, a special office that was reserved for the uh, foundation of the church, where the apostles interpreted the ministry of Christ. They interpreted the Old Testament and Christ's ministry to show the foundation of the church manifest in the New Testament administration. But it is curiously missing in this book, the apostleship of Paul. In nine of Paul's books, he puts his apostleship right at the beginning. Nine of 13 books, Paul says, Paul, an apostle. I am the chosen one of God. I am the sent one. My authority goes before me. But here he doesn't say that. He says, Paul, a prisoner. And he says, though I am bold enough to command you, I don't command you. I appeal to you. That's what he says in verse 8. He focuses on union in the body. How does the body function towards each other? Paul is modeling it for us. He's writing as a friend. He could command, but because he loves Philemon, instead he appeals to him. Some commentators will take this letter and say, well, Paul's appealing, but he's kind of manipulating Philemon a little bit. He's saying to Philemon, you know, uh, you need to do this, and I'm not going to tell you to do it, but you better do it. It's kind of like when you get a a speeding ticket, or, well, you guys probably don't get speeding tickets, but maybe you've been riding with somebody, uh, your neighbor perhaps, who got a speeding ticket. And uh, the police officer pulls up and he gives that nice slip to your neighbor. And your neighbor says, well, I don't think I should pay this ticket. What will the officer say? The officer will say, well, you're free not to pay the ticket, but that means you're going to stand before the judge. So the officer isn't really forcing you to do it but he really is kind of forcing you to do it. And some people have said that's what Philemon is doing here, or uh, Paul is doing here to Philemon. He's not really forcing him, but his words are kind of directing Philemon in such a way that he will get the picture that he is supposed to do this. I think there is a, a better way to read it, especially because of what follows. Uh, Paul appealing to Philemon and then designating himself in verse 9 as an old man and a prisoner. I think what Paul is doing here is setting his weakness right before his brother in the faith. He's saying, I'm asking you to do something, but I'm an old man and I'm somewhere in prison. I have no real recourse if you don't want to do this. If you don't want to do this, it's not like I can come down to you and, and pay you a visit and, and tell you how badly you are behaving. Paul is not operating from a position of strength. and He can't do anything to Philemon if he should refuse. So when we think about how Paul is uh, interacting with this brother, this fellow worker, Philemon, we see a mutual respect between Paul and Philemon. Paul is appealing to him, even though he could give him a command. He prefers to appeal because he respects him. He honors him uh, as a fellow worker in Christ's kingdom. It's a question for us to ask ourselves, how do we operate when we have questions to ask of each other? Or even 
disagreements that we may have with each other? Do we operate with respect? Do we operate asking ourselves, uh, or reminding ourselves rather, that we are fellow workers, that we are brothers and sisters in Christ, that we are serving the same Lord? And Paul sets that foundation very clearly in, 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 in exhorting or appealing to his friend rather than commanding him. But in verse 10, he gets more specific about his appeal. He's about to ask something of Philemon, and, and he's about to ask something of Philemon that may actually even be hard for his friend. You see, Philemon was wronged. Philemon was treated uh, unjustly, it seems. Uh, Philemon uh, was wronged by this man, Onesimus. And Paul is asking for mercy from his friend. Paul's appeal is for Onesimus, who we know to be Philemon's slave from verse 16. There are several theories as to what happened, why Onesimus is now with Paul instead of with Philemon if he was his slave. One theory uh, says that, that Philemon was a runaway slave and that in God's providence he, he came to Rome or to Ephesus where, where Paul is in prison. And through God's providence he, he found Paul there in prison and was converted by Paul and now Paul is sending him back to the master from whom he escaped. Uh, other people have said that there was a conflict between Philemon and Onesimus. And so um, Philemon sent him to his friend Paul, who, whom he knew was in prison. All of that, of course, is, is speculative. We don't know for sure what happened. But we, kn we do know uh, something about Onesimus. We know that Onesimus, the slave is converted through Paul's ministry in prison. It says it right there in verse 10. I appeal to you for my child Onesimus, whose father I became in my imprisonment. It doesn't mean that, fall, uh, that Paul had a child while he was in prison. He has a spiritual child. Onesimus is led to the faith through Paul's ministry, even in prison. And so when Onesimus came to Paul, he was unregenerate. He was not a believer. He was... Uh, an, an opponent of God's. But as Paul ministers to him in prison, he now becomes a son of Christ. And that explains the, uh, the usefulness now to Paul that Philemon uh, is told about. Once Philemon was useless, uh, no, once Onesimus was use, useless to Philemon, but now he is useful both to Paul and to Philemon as they minister together in the kingdom of God. Uh, this is the relational aspect of Philemon and Onesimus. Paul is asking something of Philemon. And, and Philemon would be right to say, well, wait a minute. Uh, he treated me badly. He's my slave. He's operating on the civil, the civil rules of his day. He was my slave, and, and he ran away. He treated me unjustly. But Paul is asking him to overlook that. He is asking him to leave that aside, that he instead would grant him mercy. Paul, in obedience to Roman law, seems to send this slave back to his master. He could not harbor this slave forever if he was a runaway slave, and if he was sent for advice only, he had to return this slave back to his master, to Philemon. And Paul does that. He sends him back. He follows the laws of the, of the civil magistrate, but he doesn't do so kind of passively or stoically. He is sending back, it says in verse 12, his very heart. And this is an expression of the fondness that Paul has for Onesimus. Uh, Paul has grown fond of this son in the faith. He loves him. It's like his own heart is being sent back to Philemon. It's the same way that, that Paul speaks of others. But he has that same tenderness towards Onesimus. It is as if his heart is being sent away. And Paul expresses very clearly to Philemon that he would have preferred to do something quite differently. He would have preferred to have kept Philemon with him. That's what it says in verse 13. But there we see the unity of the work of the church again. Paul isn't working selfishly. Paul, as an apostle, isn't simply doing what he would prefer. He serves Christ. He is Christ's apostle. He's not Paul's apostle. And so he serves Christ. He doesn't do what he thinks he would like to do. He does what Christ would prefer. And this slave, this Onesimus, has served him since his conversion. And so he is actually sending this helper uh, 
back to Philemon. He sends Onesimus to Philemon, even in an official capacity. In Colossians chapter 4 and verse 9, we read about Onesimus. Uh, he is sending uh, Tychicus. Paul is sending Tychicus to the, Col the Colossian congregation. And with him, he says in verse 9 of chapter 4, Onesimus, our faithful and beloved brother who is one of you, they will tell you of everything that has taken place here. So Paul sends Onesimus back to his master as an official representative of, of Paul. It's likely that Onesimus carried the letter of Philemon to his master himself. He did that as a servant of, of Paul's. He delivers this letter into his master's hand. And what we see here is Paul's humility in his dealing with his, his fellow man. There are no CEOs in the Church of Christ, are there? There are no executive officers in Christ's church. It doesn't matter what our office or our function is. We serve the church. We don't serve ourselves. And so Paul does not force Philemon, but wants him to do good voluntarily. He gives freedom to Philemon's conscience. He doesn't lord it over him. Where no command is broken, no command of Scripture is broken, appeal is made. That's what the other apostles do. In Acts chapter 15, when you have the first council of, of the Jerusalem church, the apostles come together with the elders and they consider the matter. They consider uh, the Word of God together and come to a decision. There is no CEO at that meeting. Or in 2 Corinthians, in chapter 1 and verse 24, it says, But I call God to witness against me. It was to spare you that I refrained from coming again to Corinth, not that we lorded over your faith, but we work with you for your joy, for you stand firm in your faith. It is an expression of what Paul is doing here in Philemon. Uh, Paul comes uh, to Philemon, not lording it over him, but seeking to work with him for his joy to stand firm in his faith. The apostles who work with God's people are not tyrants. They are fellow servants. This, of course, requires uh, a cry for wisdom for those of us who are serving as officers in the church of Christ. The church is not our people. They are God's people. When Cliffwood comes together, we shouldn't even designate it as our church, but it is Christ's church, and we serve Christ together. We are not free to set our opinions before the church, but we are only free to enforce God's laws in his church. And I think Paul, when he writes this request to his friend Philemon, is operating in the same way, that, that freedom of conscience, that setting before him God's law, hoping and praying and trusting that he will do what the Lord requires of him. I think in verses 15 and 16, Paul anticipates an objection to some, to some extent. Uh, he anticipates his friend's words. Uh, Philemon, you can hear him maybe muttering under his breath, well, this just is, isn't fair. This isn't right. Uh, I, can't, I can't do this. It gives credence, of course, to the runaway theory of Onesimus' uh, union with Christ. But it says in verses 15, and 16, for this perhaps is why he was parted from you for a while, that you might have him back forever, no longer as a slave, but more than a slave, as a beloved brother, especially to me, but how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. Paul is anticipating Philemon's objection by saying uh, to him, God works in mysterious ways. Philemon, if you're having trouble accepting this, Think of how God has worked to restore Onesimus to you, not only as a slave, but as a brother now, a brother in the Lord Jesus Christ, a fellow worker, part of the, the group in the first seven verses, those who work together in Christ's kingdom. And Paul is, uh, he is reminding his friend of God's working in ways that we may not understand. In our own lives, perhaps we've seen this. How often has God worked through our sin to bring about maybe even our, our repentance, our union to Him? 
How often has Christ worked through our sin to sanctify us as we fall on our knees before Him? Uh, how, much, how often has He used our sin to deepen our awareness of His mercy, of His goodness, of His compassion? That is what Paul is setting before uh, Philemon as well. Patience and, and grace, these are essential elements of, of human relationships, of Christian relationships, because we are being sanctified. We are not finished yet, are we? We, each of us, sin in many other ways. We, uh, of course, often expect patience in our own journey of sanctification, meaning other people's patience with us, but we are slow to give our patience to those who are uh, being changed by the Holy Spirit. We expect immediate results so often. We do it with our children. We do it with our spouses. We do it with our fellow Christians. And instead, we are to learn unity in thought, word, and actions and be gracious towards each other. It's the example that Paul sets before us here in this passage. Now, in verses 16, we don't have Paul condemning slavery, which is somewhat of a mystery for some people as we read through the book of Philemon. But what he does is he makes slave and master brothers, brothers in the faith, something that would have been unimaginable in that time and in that place. But that's what Paul does. He says to Philemon, the slave owner, you see this slave that you have. He is your brother. He is your brother in Christ. He is your fellow worker. He is your fellow soldier. So he sets in place not a, an explicit condemnation of slavery, and this is somewhat of a side note, but he does set in place the foundation for the elimination of the practice of chattel slavery uh, that was found in Rome and part of our own country's history as well. But Paul does it also graciously. He does it patiently. He sets before Philemon a request, not a commandment. Then we want to look a little bit at Paul's plea in verses 17 through 21. When, when Paul pleads uh, with, with Philemon, uh, he makes an appeal to him based on his relationship with Philemon, Paul's relationship with, Philemon, uh, with Onesimus. Sorry, I'm getting those next names confused. Not Philemon's relationship with Onesimus. Uh, earlier, their, their partnership was questioned in verse 17. If you consider me your partner, then receive Onesimus as you would receive me. Paul is asking Philemon to see Paul when he receives Onesimus. Hard as that may have been for him to receive, instead he comes asking based on Paul's relationship with Onesimus. It's like he is giving a referral, like we do when we need a car repaired. When we need our car fixed, we and we're new in town, we refer somebody. And we're saying, when you go to this person, you entrust me. See me when you go visit the mechanic or the plumber or whatever, whatever service you need. That's Paul's approach to Philemon. Paul is the one who will carry the debt. Paul is the one who will bear the burden of any hardship that may exist between uh, Philemon and Onesimus. And he reminds Philemon in, in verses 18 through 20 of his credit rating, so to speak. He reminds Philemon of uh, the fact that he is good for it. His credit score is excellent. Paul's uh, spiritual credit score, that is. Uh, if it were possible, uh, in the spiritual realm, Paul would be getting all kinds of spiritual credit card applications because his credit score is so good. He has stood before this man, has served him well. Paul, in essence, is saying, if you don't feel like it, do it for me, through who you got your life also. We see that Paul is reminding Philemon, Philemon, uh, do this for me, because your very life is owed to me. It seems that Philemon himself was con converted uh, by Paul. And so Paul is appealing to him, uh, see the value that has been given to you through my work and apply it to Onesimus. Now, Paul is not at all unsure of how, how uh, Philemon will respond to these words. He says in verse 21 that he is confident in his obedience, not confident only that he will listen to what Paul says, but that he will do even more than what Paul 
has said. So how does Paul respond or interact with Philemon? He does it uh, knowing that, that Philemon will uh, respond graciously, generously. He knows that Philemon will do, will do even more than what Paul has asked of him. It's important that we recognize that as people in Christ's church, that we have a generous spirit toward each other. A generous spirit, I think, will show up first in our prayers. And when we pray for our fellow Christians, or maybe we should ask, do we pray for our fellow Christians? Do we spend time praying for each other in this congregation? Do we spend time asking for God's favor to rest on each other? I guarantee you it will be much more difficult to harbor a grudge against somebody when you are lifting them up in prayer from day to day? Are you gracious towards your fellow Christian in prayer? Or perhaps in hospitality? Are you generous towards your fellow man in hospitality? How can my home be used to refresh others? Or maybe in teaching? Is what I'm saying biblical? And perhaps even more importantly, am I saying it graciously? Am I generous in my conviction about how this brother will respond to the clarity of God's Word? Am I being generous in spirit or in our living next to each other? Do we, like Paul, assume love for God in each other? Do we, like Paul, assume integrity towards Christ in the brothers? Is that our default? It is how Paul treats Philemon, when he makes these requests of his brother in the faith. And then Paul says goodbye. He doesn't say goodbye on, on bad terms, but on, on good terms. He even says that he hopes to come for a visit to Philemon's house. He asks for him to prepare a guest room, that Philemon's prayers of Paul's liberation from prison would be answered. Paul has just made a big request of his friend. But he doesn't expect that fellowship will be broken as a result of this request. He assumes that they are continuing on as fellow servants, as brothers, as fellow soldiers. The letter began by establishing unity. And it, 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 it ends the same way in, in verses 23 through, through 25. He speaks of all the other fellow soldiers, Epaphras and Mark and Aristarchus and Demas and Luke and their greetings that are sent to Philemon. The brothers with Paul greet Philemon and the aged apostle says goodbye, wishing the grace of Christ beyond Philemon, his fellow worker. In Paul's letter, though the questions that are being asked of Philemon are not applicable perhaps to us, the way that he goes about asking them is. He asks his friend graciously, basing his appeal on their unity. Paul models something for the church. The question that, are, that Paul is asking is not one we will ask, but his respect is what we ought to use towards each other. His charita charitability, is that a word? His charitability towards his friend is something that we should use. And the generosity of spirit that he has towards this fellow worker is something that we should use. Uh, it is the way that we love our fellow man as Christ has loved us. We are commanded in God's Word to love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and that we are to love our neighbor as ourself. What Paul does here in the letter of Philemon is simply manifest a small slice of what it means to love our neighbor as ourself. May God, through His Holy Spirit, give us the wisdom and the strength to implement that here in our congregation also. Let's pray together.